Okay, so this is ID1, and I'm going to go over problems 1 and 2 from ID1, and then problems 1 and 2 from ID2, and then um, from there I'll just do the problems from ID1. Uh, so <coughs> if you have ID2, maybe you could just uh, look through and work through these problems with me, and then use that to help you understand how to do ID2 for the rest. Okay, so first off, um, I'm supposed to graph this function, this cubic function, so I guess the first thing I want to make sure that you remember to do is think about what a cubic function looks like, and it looks something like that, okay? So um, having that in my mind is, is key to understanding like what points I'm going to graph, um, and especially like how the transformations affect the graph. So um, one thing you need to remember is that any time there's something in front of x, you have to factor it out. So this is actually the same thing as 1 half. Um, and then we factor out the negative, anything in front of the x. And so when you factor a negative out of negative x, you're left with x. And when you factor a negative out of positive 9, you're left with negative 9. And that's being cubed plus 6. So as far as transformations go, uh, the 1 half on the front is being multiplied on the outside. It is a vertical compression by a factor of 1 half. The negative on the interior is a reflection across the y-axis. Uh, minus 9 means go right 9, and plus 6 means go up 6. <coughs> so opposite on the inside, exactly what you think on the outside, okay? So, um, okay, if this is x cubed, but then I flip it over the y-axis, then it's good to have a little uh, picture of what that's going to look like. So my graph should go up to the left and down to the right. Okay, so I'm going to go over... Um, to the right 9, up 6, and plot a point. It's also a big clue if you try to go left 9 that the graph doesn't even go left 9. So that's a, a way to know that something is wrong. So I'm going to this. Okay, so <coughs> uh, for cubics, you've got a pattern, and um, it's not like I, I've make the pattern up. Um, it, it is just uh, raising numbers to the third power. So when I draw the pattern, I use this to draw it. I know from the center point, I'm going to go over and up, over and up, right and down, right and down, right? So I know one cubed is one, two cubed is eight, one cubed is one, two cubed is eight, so I'm plugging it into x cubed. But then it said vertical compression by a factor of one half, which means um, when I go over, that's a horizontal and then down, that's a vertical, so I'm only going to go down 0.5, I'm only going to go down 4. I'm only going to go up 0.5, I'm only going to go up 4. So from this point, I'm going to go to the right 1 and down 0.5. I'm going to go right 2 from the center point and go down 1, 2, 3, 4. Left 1 up 0.5, left 2, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then I'm going to connect. And so, remembering what the shape is, because sometimes you guys um, would draw <coughs> what was supposed to be a cubic and it ended up looking like a cubed root. And so if you just if you remember what it's supposed to look like and the function that you're dealing with, then coming up with the points is a little bit easier. And knowing what you should uh, be end up with. Okay? Now technically I could go ahead and graph the inverse right now. Uh, this is the point nine six, so if I go to the point six nine, that would be its center point. This is the point 10 up 5.5. So if I go over 5.5 and, and up 10, that would be one of my points. This is the point 11, 2. So if I go to the point 2, sorry. Uh, 1, 2, 2, 11. Oh, yeah, no, 2 and 11. Okay. Now I'm going to go to this point. This point is 8, 6.5, so I'm going to go 6.58, 6 6.58, and this is the point 7, 10, so I'm going to go to the point 10, 7, and without finding my inverse, I already have its graph. Okay? Now, <coughs> I'm going to go ahead and find the inverse, and I'm going to make sure that those points make sense. But honestly, if you can plot one, then you can plot the other. Okay, so I need to find the inverse. So x equals um, 1 half negative y plus 9 quantity cubed plus 6. 
I need to solve for y, so I'm going to subtract 6. 1 half negative y plus 9 equal to g. Um, I'm trying to solve for y, so I need to get rid of that 2, well, that 1 half in the front. The opposite would be to multiply by 2. But um, you got to be careful because a lot of people just wrote 2x minus 6. It wasn't going to work. Okay. But you're, in fact, multiplying that times everything. If you want to leave it as 2 times x minus 6, you can. Or you can write 2x minus 12. And then that simplifies that with that, leaving you with negative y plus 9 quantity cubed. The inverse of the power of 3 is the cube root. So we're going to take the cube root of both sides. And I'm left with the cube root of 2x minus 12 equals negative y plus 9. Um, need, I'm going to subtract 9. The cube root of 2x minus 12 minus 9 equals a negative y. A lot of people forgot that negative. <coughs> and then when you divide out the negative, it's think of it as like, you know, you're just changing the sign of everything. So if you change this sign, then everything over here would change sign. This, this quantity, this cube root, would become a negative cube root. And that would become a positive 9. So my inverse is the negative cube root of 2x minus 12 plus 9. Now I am going to write below it 2 times x minus 6. This is a reminder of my transformations. So what are my transformations? Well, a negative on the outside is a flip over the x-axis. And um, remember, x is a y switch. So if this is a flip over the y in the original, then this is a flip over the x in the inverse. Um, the 2 on the inside, opposite of what you think it's on the inside, is a horizontal compression by a factor 1 half, just like the other one had a vertical compression by a factor 1 half. Minus 6 on the interior means go right 6. And plus 9 on the exterior go means go up 9. <coughs> just like this meant right 9 up 6, this means right 6 up 9. So I've got a cube root function. And you got to remember what a cube root function looks like. Looks like this. Okay, well, when I flip that over the x-axis, um, this would come down here and this would come up there, meaning it would look something like this, which is what that looks like, right? Just flipped. Okay, so as far as pattern goes, it's um, right and down, right and down, left and up, left and up. And now I'm putting the numbers into the cube root. The cube root of 1 is 1. I don't know any other cube roots until I get to... Um, like 1, 2, or 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, but I know the cube root of 8 is 2. 2 root of 1 is 1, cube root of 8 is 2. Okay, now um, this is a horizontal compression. The horizontals in this case are the 1's and the 8's, just like the verticals over here were the 1's and the 8's. So I go over 0.5, down 1, over 4, down 2, left 0.5, up 1, left 4, up 2. So let's see if that makes sense. I go right 6, up 9. Right 6 up 9. I'm going to go right 0.5 and down 1. And I'm going to go right 4 and down 2. Left 0.5 up 1, left 4 up 2. And I plot those points already. Okay, <coughs> so there you go. Okay, um, let me look at number 1 from ID2. So, very similar situation. Uh, you've got um, 1 half negative x plus 2 quantity cubed plus 7, so you want to factor out that negative, and then you can see that it is a vertical compression by a factor of 1 half, a flip over the y to the right 2, and up 7. Flip over the y on the inside, right? So I'm going to go right 2, up 7. And um, a cubic function normally looks like this, but I'm flipping it over the y, so now it looks like this. So I'm going to go um, over, down, over, down, left, up, left, up. One cubed is one, two cubed is eight. One cubed is one, two cubed is eight. Vertical compression by a factor of one half. So my verticals are cut in half. Okay. So from this point, I'm going to go right one down at 0.5, right two down four. Left one up 0.5, left two up eight, I'm sorry, four. So it puts me at 11. 
One thing you got to be careful is that some people drew this and they went kind of wild. And they had this going over here, they had this going over here and crossing, and it doesn't cross <coughs> this line for quite a while. Okay, so I'm going to find the inverse. So similar, just, just like it. X equals 1 half negative y plus 2 quantity cubed plus 7. So subtract 7. And I multiply by 2. Take the cube root. Subtract 2. And divide out the negative. And you get basically the same situation as the last one. Or the last the other version. Uh, you've got a flip over the um, x-axis. Flip over the x. Uh, this is 2 times x minus 7 as we saw up here. So that means a horizontal compression by a factor of 1 half. The um, minus 7 means go right 7, and the plus 2 means go up 2. So if I were to go right 7, up 2, and then think about my cube root function. So cube roots normally look like this, but then you flip it over the x, they look like this. So right and down, right and down, left and up, left and up. Cube root of 1 is 1, cube root of 8 is 2, cube root of 1 is 1, cube root of 8 is 2. Horizontal compression by a factor of 1 half, so 0 0.54, 0 0.54. So I'm going to go right 0 0.5 and down 1. And then I'm going to go right 4 and down 2. 1, 2, 3. Down 2, left 0.5 up 1. And left 4 up 2. 1, 2. And if you do, Draw, draw the diagonal, you should see that it is a reflection across it. <coughs> so they should reflect across that line, and they do look like they do. So, okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go to number two in version one. So the biggest thing on this one is I was trying to test whether or not you remembered or that you knew because it's something that we should just know that the inverse of a square root is only half a parabola, okay? So this square root, I've got negative the square root of 1 half x plus 3 and then minus 4. So again, there's something in front of the x, which means we need to factor it out. So 1 half quantity and then minus 4, right? So when you factor something out, it's like dividing by it. So when you factor 1 half out of 3, it's like how many halves are in 3, and the answer is 6. But you can see it as 3 times the reciprocal 2 over 1. And so it's actually x plus 6. Okay? A good way to check yourself, because I have a lot of people that got wrong numbers right here. If you distribute the 1 half, you should get back to that. Okay? So I have a lot of people that put 3 halves right here, but if you multiply 1 half times 3 halves, you get 3 fourths, which is not the original. Okay? Um, you have built-in ways to check yourself, so make use of those. Okay, uh, square root in general. So square root is a half uh, parabola, right? Well, this negative in front is a flip over the x-axis, so in actuality it should look like that, okay? The one-half in the front is a horizontal stretch, remember opposite on the inside, by a factor of reciprocal 2, less 6, and down 4. So I'm going to go left 6, down 4, plot my starting point. And then I'm going to use what I know it should look like. It should look like this, right? So I'm going to go right and down, right and down, right and down. Um, it's a square root, so let's think uh, negative square root. Let's think square root of numbers. Square root of 1 is 1. Square root of 2, square root of 3, square root of 4 is 2. And then square root of 9 is 3, right? But as far as um, plotting those points, I've got a horizontal stretch by a factor of 2, which means I'm going to go to the right 2 and down 1. I'm going to go to the right 8 and down 2. And I'm not going to be able to see it, but I would go down to the right 18 and down 3. So I'm going to go to the right 2, down 1, and to the right 8, down 2. And I know that it should just look like 
have the sideways parabola. And there we go. Okay, as far as domain and range goes, domain is how far left and right it goes. So it goes from the left, negative 6, all the way to infinity. And range is how low and how high it goes. So the lowest it goes, it exists all the way down here at negative infinity because it keeps on going. But the highest it goes on the y-axis is negative 4. So negative infinity up to negative 4. Now, I should know that the domain and range of my inverse flip and become the range and domain of my uh, oh, I just put a bracket on infinity um, of my inverse. So the range here becomes the domain, negative infinity, negative 4, and the range is the old domain, negative 6 to infinity. Okay, let's prove that. I want to find the inverse. So x equals negative the square root of 1 half x plus 3 minus 4. And I will say that I saw some... Um, some bad order of operations in, in, in doing this process right here. So you need to make sure that you're really clear on what is the next legal thing you can do algebraically, okay? It's not all, well, I'll tell you in a second. So first, I add 4. Right here, I saw a lot of bad stuff. I saw a lot of people squaring, and you squared this side. But then you forgot that there's a negative out front. And, and if you square this side, you have to square the entire side, which technically gets rid of the negative which in this case is okay because you're talking about a parabola and when you um, when you have a negative on the interior of a parabola it flips it across the y-axis so a parabola that does this oh it flips well now it still does that so it actually wouldn't matter if you got rid of it but what happened was a lot of you put it on the outside because you got rid of this you got rid of the square root illegally because you didn't deal with the square or you didn't deal with the negative being squared so you, you do want to divide by a negative first. And so that becomes negative x plus 4 or negative times... Uh, just kidding. Wow, that was bad. Negative x minus 4 or negative times x plus 4. So the square root of 1 half x plus 3. The inverse of the square root is the square. So you would square both sides, which you cannot distribute right here. And then you want to subtract 3. So when you subtract 3, you get negative x minus 4 quantity squared. E Ooh, minus 3 equals 1 half x. And then the <coughs> last thing you want to do is multiply by 2. Again, a lot of people did this. They put a 2 out front, and they called it good. But you are multiplying the entire expression by 2. So it becomes 2 times negative x minus 4 squared minus 6 equals... Oh man, I had two x's the entire time. Y. Y. Not gonna lie. I did that. But I did. I just left the y when it's not even there. So, y inverse is almost that. So the transform or the um, inverse is two times negative x minus four quantity squared minus six comma, because that right there is a full parabola, and I cannot have a full parabola being the inverse of just a square root. So I have to think about what side it is. And if you think about this, the inverse of a parabola is a sideways parabola. Yeah. Well, the inverse of the right hand side of the parabola is the top square root, the positive square root, but the inverse of the um, negative, well the left hand side of the problem, is the negative square root. So if I start with a negative square root, then I have to end up with the left side of the problem. And in fact, it's right here. My domain should only be negative infinity and negative 4, which means this only exists for x is less than or equal to negative 4. If you have this written down, from finding it over here, then you have your, your domain restriction right in front of you. X has to be less than or equal to negative 4. So as far as transformations goes, a 2 on the outside is a vertical stretch by a factor of 2. Again, this is a horizontal stretch, so this is a vertical stretch. This is the same thing as negative times the quantity x plus 4. Uh, a negative on the interior flips it over the y, but again for a problem, it doesn't really matter. Oh well. Sorry, my computer went blank for a second. 
Okay. Um, plus four means go left four, and minus six means go down six. So I think a lot, a lot of you got differing numbers here and there because you factored out wrong, but then you got a six here. Um, you didn't do the whole negative part, so things were not matching up, and you knew that, and you in the way that you knew they should. Um, those are all clues that something is wrong, and um, I know that you probably felt like you didn't have enough time to figure that out. But hopefully, you will in the future. Okay, so I'm going to go left four down six. Left four down six, just like this one was left six down four. Um, it is a parabola, right? But only left hand side, so only that portion of a parabola. So I'm going to go left and up, left and up, left and up. 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, and 3 squared is 9, but it's a vertical stretch. So 2, 8, 18. So from this starting point, I'm going to go left, 1, up, 2. And this is a point negative 5, negative 4, just like this is a point negative 4, negative 5. I'm going to go left, 2, and, over, and up, 8. Left, 2, and up, 8. So this is the point negative 6, 2, just like this is the point 2, negative 6. I'm going to draw my half of a parabola. And then we see domain and range fit. Domain is negative infinity up to negative 4, so from left to right. And range is negative 6 to infinity. And all of that makes sense. Okay. All right, I'm going to do it on the other one right quick. Ivy 2. So, again... The negative on the exterior is a flip over the x. I've got to factor that one half out, and that is x plus four. Two divided by one half is the same thing as two times two. So that means horizontal stretch by a factor of two, go left four, and go up three. So we're gonna go left four up three. It is a negative square root. So just like on the other one, I know a square root looks like this but a negative looks like that. So, um, pattern over, over, down, right, down, one, uh, the square root of one is one, the square root of four is two, the square root of um, nine is three. Sorry, I just got kind of drew a blank there for a second. Horizontal stretch by a factor of two, so two, eight, 18, not gonna see it. So I'm gonna go right two down one, and right eight down two. Uh, domain, left to right, the farthest to left it goes is negative 4, the farthest to right it goes is infinity. Range, the lowest it goes is negative infinity, the highest it goes is 3. Okay. So, inverse. I'm going to switch x and y, this one will actually only write y. Negative the square root of 1 half y plus 2 plus 3, subtract the 3. Negative 1 half y plus 2. Uh, divide by negative, so negative x plus 3 equals the square root of 1 half y plus 2. Square both sides. Negative x plus 3 plus u squared equals 1 half y plus 2. Subtract the 2. Negative x plus 3 plus u squared minus 2 equals 1 half y. Multiply by 2. Negative x plus 3 plus u squared times 2 minus 4 equals y inverse. Ish. Okay. So two quantity oops, just kidding. Two quantity negative x plus three quantity squared minus four comma. So I'm gonna remember that this is negative and then x minus three, just like we saw right here. So that way we can multiply by a negative. And my transformations are vertical stretch by a factor of two. I flip over the y-axis to the right three and down four. So this was left four up three, this is um, right three down four. I guess I'm trying to say this. This is the point negative four three, this is the point three negative four that I'm about to go to. And in fact I could just plot these points. So negative four up three, um, three negative four. This is the point negative two two, so I'm going to go to point two negative two. This is the point four one, so I'm going to go to point one four. And if I connect those, then I see I've got the reflection of the other graph across the diagonal. Now, that is a parabola, but only half a parabola. 
and its domain is negative infinity up to 3. Negative infinity up to 3, which is exactly what my old range was, and that right there tells me my domain restriction, only for x is less than or equal to 3. Okay? Now, if this had been the positive square root, then this would be the positive, or the right-hand side of the problem. Okay? Uh, my range is low to high, negative 4 to infinity, just like my domain of the original. And there you go. Okay, so, and let's go to number three. So it says pick the option that is not a transformation acting on the parent function x cubed. So this says reflect over the x-axis that is a reflection of the x-axis, the negative, so that's true. The vertical stretch by a factor of four-thirds, that is what that is, so we're good. Left five, that's a definite no. Um, this is 2 times the quantity x plus 5 halves, which actually means you're going left 5 halves. So C would be the answer because a 2 on the interior is a horizontal compression by a factor of 1 half. Okay? Alright, um, number 4 says perform the operation and determine the domain of the new function. I guess I should say operations. Alright, so the first function is a problem. Its domain is all real numbers. It's a. Um, Polynomial, right? So domain or polynomials exist everywhere. Negative infinity to positive infinity, or all the numbers. Uh, G has a fraction, and there are two issues that I said you had to worry about in here on this test: uh, fractions and square roots. Okay. Well, fractions just don't exist where you divide by zero, so that means x cannot be zero. So everything but zero. Okay. F plus G means add these two functions. So x squared plus 3x plus 2 plus 4 over x. And, okay, so technically I could find a common denominator and multiply this by x and multiply all of this by x and say my final answer is x cubed plus 3x squared plus 2x plus 4 over the common denominator x, but you don't have to do that. Um, I'd like for you to know that you can and should, uh, but you don't have to. As far as domain goes, Yes, this, this existed everywhere, but when I add this, this never existed at zero, so it still doesn't exist at zero. So my domain is everything but zero. Okay? Now, as far as g divided by f, so g is 4 over x, and then when I divide it by f, when I divide it by this quadratic, well, now I have, an, I have bigger issues. So I still can't equal zero because of that right there. Anytime I'm dividing, uh, anytime you have a fraction in your original expression, whatever makes the denominator zero is out, okay? But now I have this in my denominator as well. I've got an expression divided by this quadratic, right? So if I were to flip and multiply 4 over x times 1 over x squared plus 3x plus 2, anywhere that this would equal zero is also out. And this factors to x plus 1, x plus 2 which means not only is 0 out, but also negative 1 and negative 2. So my domain, I guess I can finish out my final answer. This final answer is 4 over x cubed plus 3x squared plus 2x. And it only exists for all real numbers except negative 2, negative 1, and 0. And there you go anything that makes the denominator zero. Okay, um, number five. I've got two different square roots going on. So remember, anytime you've got a square root, you cannot, square roots don't exist when you take the square root of a negative number. They're imaginary at that point. So um, I've got to find out when three minus x is either zero or positive, meaning when it's greater than or equal to zero. So I solve. So if I were to subtract 3 over and then divide by a negative, I end up with x is less than or equal to positive 3. And if you were to test that, you're like, wait a minute, it, do I flip the inequality or not? And if you pick a number greater than 3, like 5, 3 minus 5 is negative 2. The square root of negative 2 does not exist. It's imaginary. Um, and if you pick a number less than 3, like say 0, 3 minus 0 is 3. The square root of 3 is a number. It's fine. Okay? So my domain is everything up until 3 and nothing past it. Okay? In the same way, my domain of G 
x plus 5 has to be greater than or equal to 0, which means x has to be greater than or equal to negative 5, which is negative 5 to positive infinity. As far as f times g goes, it's just the square root of 3 minus x times the square root of x plus 5. You could, if you wanted to, simplify this and say the square root of um, the binomial times the binomial. You do not have to do that. And my goal was more that you understand what that meant for the domains. Okay? This one only exists up until 3. Okay? So this one only comes to it existing on these numbers. This one only exists from negative 5 to infinity. So when, like, literally the only numbers that these two will exist are on these two um, intervals, right? Well, when you multiply them, you get this new expression that has to do with both of them, right? Um, this one existed over here at negative 7, uh, the, this one right here. But this one does not exist at negative 7. This one over here existed at positive 10, but this one does not exist at positive 10. 3 minus 10 is negative 7. Squared negative 7 is imaginary. So the only values of x for which both of these exist, or this new expression exists, is from negative 5 to 3. Okay? I can plug in negative 5 and get 0 times the square root of 8. That's fine. I can plug in 1 and get the square root of 2 times the square root of 6. That's fine. That's a real number. But anything outside of those, then the expression, the new expression, which is a combination of the two, does not exist. So for f divided by g, we just have one more added component. You have a fraction. f is the square root of 3 minus x. g is the square root of x plus 5. Okay? This still only exists from um, uh, negative infinity up till 3. But this one now no longer exists at negative 5 this expression. This function does it by itself, but this expression does not. So what I know is that I can no longer be negative 5, but I can still go up to 3 and exist there. Okay? So the only thing that changes between these two is now it can't equal negative 5 because that would be 0 in the denominator, which is undefined. Okay? You could rationalize. You don't have to. I wouldn't expect all right, number six. Domain of f. So 4 over x minus 1 is a fraction, and my issues of fractions are when I divide by 0. So the value of x that would make that an issue is 1, which means my domain is negative infinity to 1 and 1 to infinity. In g, my domain issue is negative 1. So the domain is negative infinity, negative 1, negative 1 to infinity. And there you go. Okay? Anything that makes a fraction uh, 0 in the denominator is out. Now this is f of g, composition, which means f composed of g. So where there's an x and f, I replace it with g. So one thing you need to remember about domain with uh, composition of functions is that the domain of your interior function is always an issue. This expression right now, and forevermore, will not exist at negative 1 because um, though I'm going to simplify it, it came from this expression right here, which had an issue at negative 1. So your interior domain is always part of your domain. Okay? Now we're going to simplify. I have a fraction within a fraction. So what I want to do is I want to find a common denominator and simplify. So this is over 1. I'm going to multiply by x plus 1 in the numerator and denominator, so now I have a common denominator. In the, num in the denominator, sorry. So this is 4 over 1. I'm going to rewrite that as a fraction. Over. Now, you guys tend to write them as separate fractions. Um, I want you to think about, you know, immediately instead of writing this, I'd rather you just combine it into a single fraction. The common denominator is x plus 1. The numerator is combined 3 minus 1 times x plus 1, right? 3 minus 1 times x plus 1, or 3 minus x minus 1. 3 minus x minus 1. So you're subtracting all of that, right? You're just doing a negative 1 if you want to think about it like that. So 3 minus 1 is 2, so this is the same thing as 4 over 1 over 2 minus x over x plus 1. 
When you divide by a fraction, you can multiply by its reciprocal. So we're actually going to multiply by x plus 1 over 2 minus x. Okay? And then final answer, 4 times the quantity x plus 1 is 4x plus 4 over 2 minus x. So the thing for domain is, think about your interior function, and then simplify, see what happens, see what you're left with in the denominator. x cannot equal 2 because of this expression right there. So my domain is negative infinity to negative 1, negative 1 to 2, and 2 to infinity. Now you're not guaranteed a pretty number, right? If this had been uh, 2 minus 3x, then it would be uh, 2 minus 3x cannot equal 0, negative 3x cannot equal negative 2, x could not equal 2 thirds. And so you would have put 2 thirds in there instead of a positive 2. But I didn't say that. I'm just saying it's not always pretty. And there you go. Okay? So when you do composition, you find the domain of the interior function as part of your domain, and then you simplify, and then you see whatever, what extra uh, issue you have. Okay? Or you can use the process that I taught you when we first learned it. Apply the interior, the domain of the exterior function to the interior function. Okay? Number seven. Find the inverse of the function in each composition once to prove they are inverses. So, um, this is a y. So we want x equal y minus 5 over 2y. Alright, I need to solve for y. I know I've got two different y's. This, uh, every time you find the inverse of a rational expression, it follows the same kind of process. You don't want to deal with division, so you multiply both sides by 2y. So you don't have a variable in the denominator. So 2xy equals y minus 5. Every single time you do this, every time you, every time you find the inverse of a rational expression, you've got to get all the y's on the same side. and all the not y's on the other side. And then just see it as factor a y out of both. If I factor a y out of both of these expressions, I get 2x minus 1 equals negative 4. Now I had some people just put 2x, they didn't do the minus 1. To which I would reply, remember that this has to equal this. So I, if I distribute the y, I get 2xy minus y, which gets me back to the original. Okay? I'm trying to solve for y, and then multiply my 2x minus 1. So if I divide by 2x minus 1, then I've got my inverse, negative 5 over 2x minus 1. Okay, so I'm going to do this two different ways. Um, I'm going to plug y into y inverse, and I'm going to plug y inverse into y, just to, so you can see either way it works, okay? So the first way I'm going to do this, minus 5 and then 2 times. Okay, so inside of y, I'm going to plug in y inverse. Negative 5 over 2x minus 1, negative 5 over 2x minus 1. And the other way I'm going to do it is starting with this one. Negative 5 over 2 times and then minus 1. And in its place I'm going to put x minus 5 over 2x. Okay? So uh, and like, like I said, you only had to do it w w one of the ways, but I want to prove to you that they work the other way. Okay, on this one, I want a common denominator in the numerator, so I'm going to put divided by 1, and I'm going to multiply by 2x minus 1. So I've got negative 5. You know, I've got a common denominator now, so I can just combine them under 1 into one fraction. Negative 5, and then I'm going to distribute a negative 5 to both of these. Minus 10x plus 5. Negative 5 times 2x and negative 5 times negative 1. Over 2 times negative 5 is negative 10 over 2x minus 1. Now you might notice that the negative 5 and the 5 in the numerator cancel out, and that when I flip and multiply by the reciprocal of the denominator, 2x minus 1 over negative 10, those simplify out, and then you're left with negative 10x divided by negative 10, which leaves you with just x, which is the goal. Alright? So in this one, I am going to distribute my uh, 2 right here. So I'm going to say negative 5 over 1, we got that as a fraction, over 2x minus 10 over 2x minus 1 over 1. We wrote that 1 as a fraction. Common denominator in the denominator is 2x. 
So I've got negative 5 over 1 over 2x minus 10 minus 2x over 2x. And you notice that the 2x's will simplify each other out in the numerator over the denominator. And then I flip and multiply by 2x over negative 10, which leaves me with negative 10x over negative 10, which is x. Okay? I had some of you tell me that, you know, you did this and you're like, they're not inverses. And that's like, I mean, I, I get that it didn't work out for you, but the point um, was that you found the inverse and proved it, right? So, um, well, some of you made statements, I mean, the best that you could, because you know, I had some, I mean, enough time to know that someone was wrong. So, I appreciated that. Okay. Um, use composition to determine whether the function are inverses. So, I'm going to work this both ways. Um, on the test, I'm okay if you just work it one way. So, on ID2, I think that they're not inverses, but uh, hint, hint, on the retest, they are going to be inverses, so it's just a matter of you making sure that you uh, correctly apply the operations. So, I'm going to start with this one. Negative 6 times the fifth root of 7, and then I'm going to leave some space to write this function in, and then plus 4 minus 10. So, inside where there is an x, I'm going to replace that with this other function. 1 7th, negative 1 6th, x minus 5 thirds quantity to the 5th power, minus 4 7ths, and then close parentheses. And the reason why I wanted to do this in two different colors is because it, it got kind of muddy as far as like what the next step was. A lot of you saw that 7 times 1 7th is 1. But you forgot that you're multiplying 7 times this entire quantity, which means 7 times the first term and 7 times the second term. 7 times 1 7th, I agree, is 1. But 7 times negative 4 7th, which a lot of people didn't see, is negative 4, and that's very important. So I've got negative 6 times the fifth root. This times this is 1, so 1 times, and you don't need to write that one, I just did, just to make sure you knew where it was coming from minus 4 plus 4 and then minus 10, right? Well, some of you had a negative 4 sevenths right here and you went ahead and simplified the fifth root and the fifth power. You cannot do that. That would be like me saying the square root of x squared plus 3 is just x plus 3 because they cancel each other out and they don't. They cannot. You got, you got addition. That doesn't make sense, okay? So only if these two simplify out and I've just got the fifth root of something to the fifth power can I simplify them out. And now that I do, I can. I can say this and this cancel each other out. And I've got negative 6 times negative 1 6 minus 5 thirds. Ooh, x. Minus 10. Distribute my negative 6. That becomes a positive 1. x. Negative 6 times negative 5 is a positive 30. 30 divided by 3 is 10. Minus 10 is x. And we're good. Okay, I'm actually just going to work it out that way. Okay, so I hope that helps, and um, you're not guaranteed that the review or that the retest questions are going to be exactly the same. But if you understand the ideas, you know, finding the inverse of a rational, when you've got um, inverses or when you've got composition, you've got to find the domain of the interior function, and then simplify it and find the domain of your um, final expression. Your domain issues are fractions and square roots. Anything on anything squared has to be greater than or equal to zero. Um, then you should be okay. All right?